The Catholics of Oz is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 75 of The Catholics of Oz. The Catholics of Oz is a show where we discuss faith, culture, and what's been happening from an Aussie perspective. Whether it's synods or science, apostolates and apps, providence or productivity, you can hear it right now on The Catholics of Oz. Hello and welcome to episode 75 of The Catholics of Oz. So happy to have you all with us for this uh, latest episode. I'm Lindsay Sant, host of the show, but I don't host it alone. I also host it with my lovely sister, who's a little bit cooler this morning, Caroline Knights. Caroline, how are you today? I am very cool this morning. It's a cold morning. <laughs> yes, autumn's creeping in. Yep. <laughs> yes, yes. Can't say I'm loving it, but that's all right. We have to have cold, don't we? Sometimes. Yes, it's coming. Yep, it's our it's our turn. Yeah. I can see it's it's uh, turning to that point in between autumn and winter, where yes. it's sunny outside, but it's actually very very cold. <laughs> yeah. so. But during the day, it will warm up, and then it gets yes. very cold at night. Yes, that's all happening. Yep. Yeah. And also joining us in this cool place is our other host and good friend, Lino Sabol. Lino, how are you today? I'm good, guys. Well, I, yeah, it is very cold. Uh, I can't believe last time we had a very cold morning. All the time has been uh, very um, humid. Is it, has it been? Yeah, very, that's very been warm. humid. We've had some cooler we did mornings. Have a humid summer. Yeah, mm. but I feel like yesterday and today were probably the coldest of, of mornings yeah. so far this year. Yeah. Yeah, I actually put the heater on this morning. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's a Melbourne that's thing to something. do. Yeah, we'll yeah. Back actually, to I'm swapping. Now. It's mm-hmm. the kind of weather where you swap between heat in the morning, mm-hmm. air conditioning when yeah. it gets quite warm so during true. the day. Yeah, yep. so it's, true. So it's true. silly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for solar panels. That's all I can say. Oh, yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, we're going to start yeah. doing that. Mm-hmm. Solar yeah. panels. We'll have to yeah. talk to God about Melbourne weather and what he had in mind there. But mm. anyway, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, before we move on, uh, if you're new to listening to The Catholics of Oz, uh, you can subscribe to the show on Apple uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or your favorite player. Don't forget to give us a five-star rating on these plays and some positive feedback because that helps us to reach new people, which is what we're all about. And I'm very excited today to uh, share a new initiative from the StarQuest Network, and that is that we're on Discord. Yay! What is oh, Discord? We're on wow. Discord. I'm yeah. Interesting. Wow. It's all happening. So uh, SQPN yeah. now has a Discord community. It's open. Come and join us. You can interact with uh, your favorite show hosts, us, uh, your favorite shows, So uh, and, uh, and hear more about what's happening in the StarQuest community and also interact with other listeners, other people who are part of the community as well. Uh, so all you need to do is go to sqpn.com slash Discord, spelled D-I-S-C-O-R-D, and then you can uh, follow the instructions on how to sign up from there. And you can use it on your smartphone, your tablet, your computer. So it's really good. So sometimes uh, when I'm at work at lunchtime, I'll just have a quick sneak peek and see what's happening on Discord. It's great. So it's just been already people are talking about what's happening on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious Worlds. People have been talking about Star Trek and Star Wars on those channels. Uh, Caroline, the science channel is already. We've yes. got some some lovely sciencey people who are sharing I love, some. Yes. Like people Share doing like sharing I their experiments and yes. everything. Oh, it's Share awesome. It. I love so it. yeah. So thank you so much for that. And on the Catholics of Oz channel, we'll continue to share uh, things that are happening um, with us and you know, give our little Aussie perspective. And we'd love to really, really just love to get to know more people who are part of the SQPN community as well, near and far. So that's, uh, that's what we wanted to share there. Um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to, to join us on there. And don't forget also the SQPN hosts all of its shows on YouTube. So you can subscribe by searching for SQPN on YouTube and then hit the bell to get notifications when new episodes of The Catholics of Oz and all of the other great shows are released as well. So let's start straight away with Faith Beyond Borders. Well, I'm actually feeling rather good about this. I think we've all arrived at a very special place, eh? Spiritually, ecumenically. How do you make somebody love you without affecting free will? (laughs) Welcome to my world, son. You come up with an answer to that one. You let me know. Yes, I had to work very hard to pass Latin and theology. Oh, quite. Those are, of course, the most important things. Oh, yeah. I'd sit this one out, Cap. I don't see how I can. These guys come from legend. They're basically gods. There's only one god, ma'am. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. So, Caroline, uh, 
this is one that we got to experience and uh, w- which was great. So mm-hmm. we'll have a, a few things to say about it. And Lino, you uh, you got to watch it online or on TV. We on the did. Night. We did. Was, so Lino, just out of curiosity, was it uh, on Channel Thirty One or YouTube that you uh, that you managed uh, we watched, to? We watched it actually on Channel Thirty One. There you go. So we, we watched it on start and goes, oh, this is so live because <laughs> we're just still waiting, yep. waiting, waiting. <laughs> we started. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah. And um, um, for some reason we, we didn't see you guys. So were you guys like right in the back in the yeah. corner somewhere? Because we didn't see you. See we were behind the cameras. Yeah, we were behind the camera, which sitting, I'm fine sitting with. with the cool people. Yeah, <laughs> we were at the cool table. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Understand. Understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so cool. um, yeah, what are we talking about? Uh, so uh, yeah, so a couple of weeks ago at this at time of uh, time of the episode releasing. Uh, we were invited to the Patrick Oration, which uh, I was, uh, which I was able to go to last year, which was awesome. So it was great. Uh, and this is where Archbishop uh, Peter Comensoli, Archbishop Melbourne, friend of the show, we're allowed to say that. Yes, we can. <laughs> yep. we can. Yeah, uh, just a uh, just a wonderful human being. Uh, we were invited along um, to uh, to listen to his Patrick Oration this year, which is always done on the feast of Saint Patrick's, and um, it's basically a speech where he outlines vision of the of, for the archdiocese um it gives a bit of an assessment of where he thinks things are in in melbourne for the melbourne church and uh and you know as always encourages us and urges us to go forward with um you know with as much evangelical vig- vigor as we possibly can so um yeah so it was great because uh last year <laughs> i went, had to go on my own because of covid so <laughs> there were very restricted numbers but this year was cool because uh not only did i get to take you caroline with me i got to take uh, uh what's it my wife isabel yeah yes, so it was hey. really so, fun to hang out yeah. together so um yeah we had a had a bit of a night out which was really awesome um yeah had to <laughs> it's a long day because I had to race straight from work, get home, mm. get changed. Wow. Come, pick you up, leave the kids at your house with our mum, yeah. Caroline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they get to the city. And somehow we made it on time after we all did. that. We did. Wow. So. You guys got there in the city. So, so cool. Yeah. 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 Nice. 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 Great. Yeah. Now, there was the, a football on at the time. Yes. So we had to get through all that. <laughs> that was correct. Was it, was it a Wednesday or Thursday, guys? It was a Thursday, Thursday night. night. Thursday night. Yeah. There were a bit yes. of. Yeah, we've been a game yeah. going on. Yeah, yep. this yep. wasn't the demons and the and what was is it? it Bulldogs um, match? Was it? I forgot. I, but it was huge. No, I think there that were, was before that. Yeah, that was before that. Yeah, yep. yeah. No, no, it's understandable. Yep. Yeah, oh, it's great you got there in time, guys, and and safely. That's fine. That's yes, fine. Yeah. did both of those, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. that was so, a fun um, night. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Caroline. No, I mean, like, we there was Bunnings across the road. We were almost tempted to go <laughs> off open late night. We're like, oh, late night Bunnings. Late this night Bunnings trip. We're like, oh, should we? And then a beer on the other what? corner. We like beer and Bunnings. That would have been a good <laughs> ending. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Beer bunnies yes. and bishops. There you go. Yes, yes. There hey, you go. That's the title name. <laughs> that sounds yes. like another podcast, guys. Come on, that's yes. A, but anyway, yeah. back to the actual yes. Patrick <laughs> oration. Yeah. We are, the reason why we went. Yes, yeah. and Caroline, it wasn't. I should not to distract, but it wasn't for the lemon tart, was it? Oh, the lemon tart was a good reason to go for it. It was great. Well. <laughs> we were talking about how much we Lovely. loved it. Yes. yes, thank you for the invitation that lemon tart was to die for at the end of it the night a- with a cup of tea. Beautiful. Unexpected highlight, yeah. Yes. But uh, the biggest highlight, obviously, was the um, was the Patrick oration itself. Um, it was the, so this was the the message delivered by Archbishop Comensoli. The first thing that was interesting for me, um, because I, I rewatched it later and I reread it, so it was half an hour, right, wasn't it? Mm. It it didn't feel like half an hour to me. It no. felt like it just flew by so quickly. And I didn't, you know, drift off or fall asleep or no. disappear. I, I listened quite intently. Uh, no. And that for me is, you know, um, is the power of a good speech is like whenever I yeah. listen to a speaker, because this is like you can, I listen to speakers where an hour speech has felt like an hour, you know, mm-hmm. um, or, or we go to a presentation and it might be an hour or whatever, but it feels like it's like the time has just flown by because you're just so engaged with with the message and what's going on. Um, so I might just give a, a bit of a summary really briefly of, of what Archbishop uh, Peter Comasoli had to say, and then we might just share some reflections on that. How does that sound, guys? Yep. Yeah, yep. okay. Understand. Yep. All right. So he started with, uh, with an analogy. So remember, Caroline, we walked in, and when we signed in, we were all given these little badges of yep. the, with these little sort of golden tiles and yeah. we're like what's this all about you know so um and we were told what was it um hang on to these because you're going to need them later so yes you know, we put our badges later. on and yeah yep. so we swore our badge tonight and, and i was trying to i was 
you know, I, I like symbolism. I'm trying to work. I had no idea at all. Was there all. a group activity? Yeah. Do you have to match them up with someone yeah, to yeah, make a yeah. picture or, you know, like a puzzle? I don't know. What, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. like a team building thing almost. Te- yeah. Yeah. Maybe something exercise. different than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was something more symbolic than that. So he explained at the beginning of, um, of the oration that uh, they represent the, the glass panels that make up the windows of St. Patrick's Cathedral which was quite amazing. So he said uh, that a lot, of, uh, a lot of cathedrals, obviously their um, windows are made, made of stained glass, but these, uh, the windows at St. Patrick's Cathedral are made from a kind of, I think it was like a kind of amber colored glass, I think it is, which is unique to Australia. And uh, it, uh, it, well, it enhances the sunlight that comes through. So if you've ever been to St. Patrick's Cathedral in the afternoon or when the sun is out, you yeah. do see these streams of light uh, coming beautiful. through the windows, it's very yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Lino, yeah. like we remember Lino long, long time ago. We used to go to Adoration, you know, on a yeah, on a Thursday. June th- yeah, Wednesday yeah. or Thursday? I can't remember. It was yeah. a Thursday. Yeah, we used to go yeah. to the six thirty, um, the six thirty Adoration, 6:30 adoration. That they in um in the city, mm. and you know, in the um afternoon, in the daylight savings, think? um, you know, oh. hours, there was still sunlight. Sunlight, yep, yeah, definitely. Um. And how, you know, and we used to always comment how brilliant it was. And then, you know, if they would, um, you know, if they had incense, you know, the smoke would just hang in the air. Like it wouldn't move around. It would just hang like, and the sunlight would beam through it. And it became very transcendent, you know, became, yeah, that's, very that's heavenly a in, in, in a sense. Insane. So it's a, yeah. this beautiful imagery in front of us while we were praying to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and, and things like that. So he started with that and, and talking about um, how, you know, the, the light shines through. And he said that um, these were given to young people. So what happens? What happened was uh, before the pandemic, and hopefully it will come back again. There were, uh, the church would have the Australian Catholic Youth Festival every two years. So I took a youth group to the first three in Melbourne, Adelaide, and Sydney. I didn't go to the Perth one because I'd stopped being a youth leader by then, and um, my second son Alexander was born. But the uh, but before you go. Uh, young people in, in Melbourne are invited to the cathedral for a commissioning mass. So I always used to take our young people the week before for that, that mass to sort of like rev them up, you know, that here's the reason why we're going and everything. So at this particular mass, Archbishop Comensoli, he had these badges given out to the young people there too, um, uh, to take the, you know, to take that Melbourne flavor, those cathedral windows with them in, in those badges. But also it was a lot, uh, it was a lot more powerful than that. It was the idea that just as the um, just as the the golden light came through the windows of the cathedral, the young people would be encouraged to be the golden light of Christ as well. So that that's the the symbolism he was going with, and the the oration really he said framing it this way, he was asking us to continue that legacy uh, of being the the light of Christ in the world today, especially in in our context of Melbourne. So he said that uh, that basically. Because of uh, the pandemic, and he said this last year in his speech as well, he referred to this, that we've been living a little bit like the people in exile. So if you think of the, the Israelites in, in exile in, um, in, in Babylon, or any people who have, been, who have been uprooted from their homes and moved to a foreign place, uh, you know, in, in exile from their homes, he said that this is kind of the mentality that we've, that we've had. And he said, not in a pessimistic kind of way, but it's an image for us to understand the context that we've been in. And he was talking about how, you know, at, at one point the church had been a bit like the center, uh, you know, of life in Melbourne, like the churches, you know, uh, but, you know, because uh, Australia in its early days was, you know, Anglican with Catholics, you know, that there was always that. Um, and, but now he was saying the church has sort of been moved, you know, or relegated, he said, to, to the peripheries in our city, in Melbourne. And so uh, he was saying that, uh, that, you know, our society has moved to a place where, and I'll, I'll quote him directly, he said, I am even informed that a generation of the unforgiven is emerging among us, young people especially, who are exiled from the experience of forgiveness and hope by a culture that sorts them by swiping left or being unfriended or simply cancelled. So there's this uh, separating into groups uh, that, uh, you know, of the in and the out uh, that you know that he was perceiving here as well, and again, he wasn't being negative, but he was just stating what he was seeing and observing as a as you know like what's the finger on the pulse right now of you know of uh, of Melbourne, not not just the church but of society generally, um, and you could even apply this to to a lot of the Western world. So 
um, he was saying, uh, you know, with the we live in uh, with an economy where personal comforts rather than shared goods are pursued. We fortify ourselves in enclaves of the like-minded, immediate satisfaction rather than immortal longings rule. And as the psalmist laments, oh, how long could we sing of the, the song of the Lord on foreign soil? And so what he said was, let's not turn this mentality of exile into our chosen lifestyle. Let's not make this our preference. It is what it is, but exile was always what happens before the beginning of something. And that was the message he was, he was putting there. So rather than saying, this is where we are, let's just accept it. This is the situation where, you know, let's be happy with just wanting immediate satisfaction. Let's just be happy with the fact that we live in our own little enclaves and we don't mix with anyone else, you know, that we can just fob people off, you know, digitally and things like that. And he said, no, 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 uh, actually exile is what happens uh, before something great. And he said that we're in a, in a liminal space uh, and liminal just means that you're, you know, you've left one thing and there's another thing in front of you and you're actually in between the two right now. So you're, you're in between, in between moments and what moment is going to be next. Uh, and so he said that uh, being in exile is not and should not be a comforting way of seeing ourselves. He said, our faith tells us that there is hope in a time of exile. There is the possibility of recreation and renewal. It opens pathways for us to rediscover the deeper roots of identity and heritage. Exile need not be a wasteland, for it opens us to discover how God does not abandon us, but accompanies us and provides for us what we need. In the shadow lands of exile, points of light and grace become more discernible. The prophet Jeremiah knew this when he encouraged the people of Israel as they fell into exile to build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat their produce, marry and have sons and daughters. You must increase there and not decrease. And so I think the, I think the message of the Archbishop is pretty clear here is that in this so-called time of exile that we've experienced post-COVID, and you know, with um, with you know, with the church being pushed to the peripheries in our, you know, in in a symbolic sense in our archdiocese, it, it's um, it's time for us to understand that yes, that's the situation, but it's time for us to increase our efforts, not allow the context to decrease our efforts with with what we do. And so he said, the people of Israel, exile was not their end, but it was their beginning. And you can look at scripture to see how that happens. And there are so many, there are so many references in scripture to, uh, you know, people being taken away from something before something, something greater happens. So if you think of, say, um, I was thinking of the exile, um, not the exile, the um, exodus of the people from Israel. And then we've got this symbolic 40 years in the desert, uh, you know, of this time. Again, it's that liminal space. It's the in-between. It's the what was there before and the, and then what's coming next. And what's interesting is, uh, I remember that uh, in scripture, the Israelites complain and say, oh, if only we were, you know, slaves in Egypt, at least there we had meats and, you know, whatever, and we had things to eat or whatever else. And they're complaining about it. And the archbishop says this as well, that uh, maybe, you know, there are some of us who are saying, look, all we need to do is, you know, just turn back the clock a little bit, you know, the, the good old days, just, just bring that back. Um, and he says, no, no, it's not good enough what we need to do is, um, is find grace in the new. And I'm, I'm actually just, that's just words I'm adding, I'm putting into his mouth there, but it is finding the grace in the new, in the what's next, in the, where is the Holy Spirit leading our church now? So, um, so as we emerge from this exile mentality, what are our evangelical powers and efforts going to look like? What are we going to do? And he has an answer for that. And I think Caroline, you, um, I think you'd mentioned how much you, you clicked with this as well. Um, and this was the the image of the domestic churches. So he went through the, the history of um, of the early church and how it wasn't, you know, even with Jesus, Jesus wasn't running around uh, trying especially to engage with big powers and, you know, create large events and, and things like that to promote the faith. He did it in family settings. Uh, there are lots of, especially the Gospel of Luke, there are lots of meal settings where, um, where uh, uh, you know, Jesus is sharing the gospel and doing his thing of forgiving and healing and speaking and so on. And so it's in the family setting um, then that the early church continued this evangelization, continued this work of growing the faith. And, uh, and he said the focus of the early church and of Jesus was personal and familial and communal. 
And I highlighted this in bold because I thought it was important. The Archbishop says, might not this also be our calling at this time and place? And then he quoted John Paul II, who had said, the future of the world and of the church passes by the way of the family. And so he was emphasizing the importance of the family being our, our catechumenate. You know, that is a, the catechumens are people who are, who are being formed and being prepared to enter the, into the church. So especially adult, uh, adults who are about to be baptized, um, they, they're catechumens, basically. So they're part of the catechumen. They're being catechized. You know, they're being prepared and trained to, to, um, uh, in their faith, in knowledge of their faith and experience of their faith before they're then baptized and enter into the family of the church. So the family is basically a, you know, a group of catechumens who are passing on the faith from the parents to the children and, and having that enriching faith experience together. So he said it uh, this way, I would like you to note in particular, the three elements that do the work in forming this household, domestic horizon of life and faith, growing in communion, mothering and teaching, serving others, or more simply, communion, formation, mission. We might describe these formational tasks by way of three active verbs, pray, or to pray, to learn, and to love. So this is how he described family life in terms of of passing on the faith and the church doing its work in this time and place today. So he said in our families, is there time for fostering prayer and a devotional life? How is the learning of faith and discipleship being attended to? Is love nurtured in the family and extended to other families and to all around you? And this is the, the third element there is that while we do what we do in our families, we then pass it on with the other families we interact with. Is it very clear that we ha- that, that, you know, our family is a family of faith and is that faith being shared in some in you know in the most appropriate way? Obviously, it's not you know Bible bash your closest friends or anything, but is that faith being shared from your family to others in the most appropriate way? So reclaiming and fostering these elements in our families will strengthen us to go out and witness to others. And then and Caroline, now I'm getting to it. The point that you loved, he made this point about how there's a sacramentality about our about our domestic families. And uh, he gave these examples that that the family it makes visible the ta- and tangible what is invisible in grace, what is washed in the kitchen sink over a conversation about faith is baptismal. Words of mercy and tenderness spoken in the lounge room is forgiving. Encouragement before stepping out the front door is confirmational. Family prayer and blessing is priestly. Tenderness and intimacy in the bedroom is matrimonial. And he said, dare I say it, even a rat test done with attentiveness and care for those we love, reveals a sacramental anointing. That was a, I liked that image a lot. That was great. Yeah. And all of this is open to being Eucharistic, acts and words and gestures of domestic communion that are holy. Do this in memory of me. And so then he expanded that. And this is the key thing. Our families do this thing together, our Catholic families. We go into our parishes. And so he, he extended this then to, the, to our parish life. And he's talked a lot about families of parishes, the, the, um, the uh, Living the Way of the Gospel initiative that, that we've talked about previous on this show is all about families of parishes. It's about, uh, so he had, he's uh, mentioned that a lot, and this program is continuing as, as parishes discern their place in it um, this year. But he said, our parish communities might best flourish by learning to embrace a catechumenal way in households, communities, and families that foster communion, formation, and mission. And he said that parishes are a place of sojourn, so this is a uh, uh, places of hospitalities, uh, locations where pilgrims might stop and gather in the evenings, places of welcome, resting, healing, nourishing, learning, sharing, preparing, and in the morning they are places from which pilgrims set out again on the road again. Imagine that as a definition of a parish, he said. If, par- if this, the power of the parish is not just the mass on Sunday, but all the things that happen around it as well. If it if it was a center of healing, of rest, of learning of sharing, of preparation, etc., and then of sending out, you know, if Jesus is great, go, uh, you know, go in the love and service of the Lord or go and live the, show the gospel by your life. Uh, what if our parishes truly, truly, truly embraced that and gave and, and assisted Catholics in their mission as, as baptized? Pope Francis, he said, uh, said that the church, uh, he said, uh, had his way of putting it this way, he said, parishes are the church living in the midst of the homes of her sons and daughters. So we are meant to be church in familial form, the Archbishop says, where devotion, formation, and apostolic works are practiced and where communion in the Lord and with one another is fostered. 
A parish is meant to draw, God's, draw near to God's people, not the other way around. It is a nearness of incarnational presence and not a nearness of territorial location. Our newly opened doors should be an invitation outward as much as a welcoming in. And I like that image of uh, as much as welcoming people to our parishes, parishes should, should be kicking people out, <laughs> out the doors, all right? Get out, evangelize, you know, but that's the whole idea. Come in supercharged and, you know, uh, in, through whatever it is that you're doing there and then out into the community and, and being a sign of Christ's presence or being the light of Christ, just like the cathedral windows, which is, again, going back to the image. So he goes back to the image um, that he had started with. So how then do we carry Christ's light? May this not be lost on us, he said, for the light we carry is not ours. It comes from that higher, deeper source, allowing us to shine. I do not need to carry Christ's light all by myself. We do it together. And so he concluded by saying, from an age of faith in a colonial city to an age of unbelief in our cosmopolitan metropolis, now is our time and place. Like our young disciples who set forth from St. Patrick's on pilgrimage in December 2019, our task is to rediscover a young church that goes out enlightened by Christ. And that's a quick summary of, uh, of a speech that had a lot more thoughts in it. Um, and so I do encourage anyone uh, who'd like to know more. We've put a, a link in our show notes to the video and also to the written speech as well, if you'd like to take some more out of it. But I highly recommend it, whether you're a Catholic in Melbourne or Australia or around the world. Um, I, I strongly urge people to to have a listen because there are there's some great encouraging thoughts there about our own our own purpose in evangelization. But Caroline, you were there, you had a listen. Mm, yes. <laughs> um, what did you take away from from um, from his speech that night? Yeah, I always love listening to Archbishop Commonsole, even when he's doing a sermon or something in church. You know, it's it's uh, he's always has some really deep, meaningful things to say and um, always something that you can really meditate and think about for a long time. But I mean, I think it feels like he's another message too, is like kind of practice the faith where you are and the situation you're in. Um, life changes all the time. I mean, and at the moment, you know, we're in a bit of a tumultuous stage on this earth of ours. Um, so much going on. We're still in pandemic there's the war, unfortunately, in Ukraine. There's many unsettled countries at the moment. I mean, Afghanistan is still a very upsetting situation for those people there. Um, you know, there are Christians in trouble all over the place, you know, in different countries but under dis different circumstances. Um, we are blessed here in Melbourne that we're still living a pretty ho-hum, ordinary life, you know. We're pretty untouched by a lot of things. Uh, maybe, okay, a bit of... Our petrol prices are quite high at the moment, but um, but we still feel the effects of, you know, what's going on around the world, and it does unsettle you a bit. Um, but, you know, and we, we did have the two years of lockdown, so that was a big deal for a lot of people. But we were still able to kind of practice our faith. We didn't have to leave it alone. Um, you know, we were still able to have on, online masses and things like that. Thank God now we can actually go to church and, and practice fully again. Um, but, you know, the part where he was saying there's sacramental life in our families, you know, like washing the dishes, baptismal, the encouragement of, um, you know, is confirmational, all of those things. I mean, I felt obviously as a mother, <laughs> um, I really related to those and, um, it, it, it's encouraging because you think, what can I? What am I doing? I I am doing. I am practicing my faith. I am practicing the sacraments, even if I'm not. I mean, you don't just practice them when you go into a church. You practice them outside. You practice them in your everyday life. You practice them with your family, and um, and that was so encouraging. And in our last um, um podcast when we had Archbishop Commonsoli on, he was saying, you know, we are priestly. You know, we are not priests, but we are priestly. So we practice these things, you know, in our lives. And I love to be reminded of that. And that was the first time I actually heard, heard you know, that us being described as priestly. I just, I, I just really held on to that and, and being reminded again um, through his speech, you know, it's very encouraging. So 
it's given me a really a joy, you know, that that I can, you know, and we all can continue to practice sacraments in our own home. And um, that's really what I took from there. So, yeah, I mean, really, really love that. Yeah. yeah. Isn't the simplicity of our role just in our family homes? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's um it's an amazing thing to think about is that actually your your evangelical powers you know well when I say power you know your your evangelical ability you know given to you by God is practiced first in in the home yes uh, and yeah. he said whatever the circumstances of our home might be but that's where that's where it it starts every one of us is connected to a family he said uh, and, and that's where we have the power a simple devotion a simple mm-hmm. Whatever it is, praying together in some way, yeah. shape, or form. Um, forgiveness, because sometimes you know, in family other. you need yeah. to forgive each other all the yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> you the know. power of um, yeah. Yeah. True. all of this kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, of all the sacraments he listed, you mentioned it just then as well, Caroline. That the um, you know confirmation is that encouragement as you mm-hmm. go out the door. Oh, Absolutely. That, so you know, as a now you said as a mother, as a dad. You know, that's something so important to me. So I've mentioned before about how I, you know, I drop Damon off at his bus stop every morning, yes, but every yeah. day when he's out of the car, like I'm always saying something encouraging, you know, it's not just have fun, go out, you know, it's like, you know, have a great day or today's Thursday, that which means tomorrow's Friday. So make the most of today, you know, all these, um, definitely, definitely. You know, all, all these things. And, and I, it's not in vain, you know, it's, it really is this encouragement that, you know, that I try to pass on. So that that confirmation, that sending out, you know, your, you know, the, uh, I love that that image that he had there 100%. as well. Hundred percent, and yeah. it's the same for me. Like, um, uh, you know, Frankie, you know, he, with his autism, he has extreme anxiety, and every morning he's very anxious to get out the door. So I have to, yeah, you're the same, you know, like, oh, today's going to be a great day. You've yes. got cross country training. You've got this and this, you know, and then he he goes out, he comes home, and says, yeah, today was really good, you know, so. What a what a gift we can give, you know? Isn't isn't that amazing? Isn't that it's like you said, so simple, but it means so much. Yeah. You know, always um, and sometimes my family cringe at me doing this, but even <laughs> um, even as a you know, in a, you could almost call it a blessing. But uh, when I leave, I always say I love you to mm-hmm. you know, like to uh, Isabel, and then Alexander if he's awake, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you yeah. know I always make sure to say I love you, and I'll see you tonight. You know, uh, I'll see you later on. Um, you know, or when they leave, you know, when someone else leaves the house, you know, it's I love you. It's almost like a blessing as that as you send them out. If yes. that you know kind of makes so sense. Right. You know, so it's Christian nice, love. Yeah. It's not just my feeling of That's love. True. It's Christian. Yeah. You know, it's Christian true. love. Um, yeah. so it does take on a sacramental form. So, um, beautiful images for us as. You know, as ordinary Catholics, you know, to to um, take into our homes, but also then to take out into into the community too. Lino, you were watching on Channel Thirty One, good old Channel Thirty One Community TV here in here in Melbourne. It was um, so Community TV. I, yeah. I must admit, yeah. Well, what were your What were your great. thoughts um, as you were watching? What What did you take out of um, the oration that night? Yeah. So the first thing that um, come up to my mind it was more, um, it was about family. That's where all our faith starts from. Um, and also he was more talking about um, what I got about it was the youth and our young people. They are our next um, generation of our faith and to help them um, find God. And that's when you're talking about either, oh, sorry, can't remember the word. <laughs> um, um, just um, to um, express our faith with them. And help them in their journey with the faith within the faith. Because I'm, I'm not saying that you know us oldies. No, we're not old. Sorry, you know, no, we're not. We're not. We're not. <laughs> I know exactly. We're not. He Mid- said midway. the church is young, so yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going right. to go with that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. And when we, um, we're all here to support each other in our faith, and that an important thing is, in a sense, is our young people. Like I keep on saying, you know, and it's the same with our parents who who go um taught us in our faith. So it's a generational thing, and and you were saying that lately because of COVID, yeah, a lot of the kids have been been too much involved. Oh, what I got was guys, but too, too too much involved in social media, maybe, you know, looking through their phones, blah blah blah, and everything. I think it's time for them to come back to the Lord, and with that, um, we need to help them with through that. So if you make sense. I I think it's more our youth need to be more. Um, um, connected to our faith and we need to help them in a sense mm. however we can yeah it's interesting what you say Lino because uh, one thing I've noticed uh, as a teacher at school is how many times a student will tell me that they about something they learned on Instagram 
And you know, I'm not, and and that's not yeah, a criticism. It's not it's a criticism. Not criticism. Yeah. But the thing is, I mean, that's where, and I, maybe the lockdown supercharged this, or maybe it's just always been there. I don't know because I don't. I've got Instagram, but I don't really use it um, that much. But the thing is, it's it's a, it was amazing how much of a teacher it it has been for you know for um for some young people and the things that they'll tell me like, whoa, is that what you actually learned? Or it's like, oh, 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 that's really good. You know, wow, I'm amazed that, you know, like they'll either pick up something really insightful or something really empty, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but true, in true. there as well is what the archbishop was saying about the, um, you know, you don't swipe people left or right or whatever, but there was this idea of, of you know, of following the people that you're comfortable with that align with you uh, and, and not moving any further beyond that, of creating your own little group um, that's, that's inclusive of everyone in it, but exclusive of everyone who's outside of it, if that makes sense. And, and I'm not saying Instagram is a bad thing. I'm, you know, I'm not against social media or anything. However, uh, it's, it's how we use it and, and what it becomes. You know, yeah, and, I'm not, and again, so not criticizing young people, you know, use Instagram, you know, whatever. But, um, but the thing is, we also need to be aware of, uh, of the challenges that that presents to the sacramentality that we're trying to pass on as well. Um, and, and the message that we have is not anti Instagram or anti, you know, social media, but it's while you're so using social media, have a think about, you know, whatever it is, provoke them with something, you know, it's that, that provocative, you know, like you guys know how artwork crazy I am at school, right? <laughs> you know, but so we give them the lenses at school or we give our students the lenses through which they can view the world, through which they can view the, their Instagram, you know, whatever it is, we do our best anyway. Um, and that's part of that. That's part of that sharing that light, the prism of light through the, you know, with the windows images that he was talking about before. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Any other thoughts, guys? There's a, there's a, we could talk about this for hours, but are there any other, any other burning ideas that you wanted to get out before we move on? Well, I didn't see you guys there. I was hoping to see some sort of close up, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you know how they go to get the camera right onto you and you're very intent. Or the, I was, I was, I was a poor woman then. She almost looked like she was falling asleep. I don't know. <laughs> you, you know how it is. You, it was you know a long know? day. I'm sure yeah, she was just... I don't know if it's yeah. asleep or if she's really concentrating. You, you, I would say you, you that second one, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's more concentration. Yeah. But, um, yeah there was plenty was of coffee. I'm sure it was the second one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I was, yeah. I was, yeah, well, it, was, it was a very good speech from um, yeah. Peter Cobb and Sally. Yeah. And... Um, I heard it. you guys had a good dinner too. What's going on there? Oh. Mm, we were fed very well, weren't we? Yes, yes. we were. It was yeah. lovely. Great dinner. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. And uh, and Isabel appreciates that everything was gluten free as well. She was very yeah, happy. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. 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 Cool. Except yeah. for the lemon tart. She had yeah. the Oh, it yeah, was the right. meringue thing. She meringue ate. Yeah. That, was, that yeah. looked the really pavlova. good. Too. Yeah, which she loved. Pavlova. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ooh, so thanks nice. for that. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so I think I'll just cap this discussion by saying, like, I think I'm, I'm sure I expressed something similar last year that the Pac Patrick oration, its message shouldn't stop with Thursday night where it was viewed. I think in some way, if we're aware of it, we should do what we can to, to live it and to share it with others. So share it um, on Instagram and Facebook. Share it on Instagram. There you go. Yep. Good start. Yes, yes, yep. Definitely. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So, um, yeah, again, thank you to Archbishop Commonsoli and also Annie, you know who you are. Thank you very much for the invitation. We really thank appreciate you. being included. We um, felt very yeah. privileged to go. I, there were a lot of uh, very more important dignitaries, more important people than than I was to be there. Yeah, look, there were a lot so, of professionals there. And, yeah. it, you know, and even like, you know, the, the ones we sat with were just beautiful people too. So just, everyone was lovely. Yeah, everyone Absolutely. was lovely, yeah. Um, yeah. Just lovely people to meet, yeah. And to see some old faces as well, like, you know, just some, it's also, yeah, a good time to, to see a few people that I haven't seen in a while. So that, that was, it was a, a lovely night for, yeah, for so many reasons. Yeah. For so many reasons, yeah. For sure. All right, so uh, let's let's cap it there. And uh, Caroline, we're going to throw it over to you because now it's time to explore some science. Ah, what a fine day for science! You have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. Can you reverse the polarity? I'll do my best. All right, Caroline. So, uh, bring back the Tassie Tiger. Is it thylacine or thylacine? Thylacine, you... yeah. All right, <laughs> bring back the thylacine. Thylacine, yes. I, I know that Jimmy Aiken has talked about this sometimes on Mysterious I think he Worlds. Was. He, did yeah. talk about it. He, he refers to it sometimes. But, Caroline, let's hear your take on bringing back the Tassie Tiger. Go for it. 
All right. So the Tasmanian tiger was a real animal, okay, not like the drop bear. <laughs> That (laughs) one of the previous episodes of Mysterious World. So this is really interesting. This is the idea of bringing back a species that's gone extinct back to life. Okay, so so the steps are being taken by the University of Melbourne to attempt to bring back the Tasmanian tiger from extinction. They the reason they can do this is because they've recently been given a five million dollar philanthropic gift, which they're going to use to establish the Thylacine Integrated Genetic Restoration Research Lab or Tiger for short. T I G R R for short. The aim uh, will be to develop technologies to potentially bring back species from extinction, but also to help safeguard other marsupials and mammals from becoming extinct as well. Unfortunately, in Australia, over the past 200 years, at least 39 mammal species have become extinct in Australia. And I'm sure that we haven't heard of a lot of those, right? Um, Unfortunately, you know, um, there's been a lot of deforestation, bushfires, drought, you know, mining, you know, Australia's been ravaged quite a lot by natural and unnatural processes. And obviously this has an effect on, you know, the animals living in the environment. Yeah, to the point where even koalas are under threat now as well. Koalas I mean, are you know, under who, threat Who would have thought <laughs> koalas? Well, we had massive bushfires and yeah, that really did, has yeah. ripped through um, their habitat, especially on places like Kangaroo Island. There were big parts of the Blue Mountains in yes, New South yeah. Wales ravaged. Um, these are places we hadn't heard of big bushfires mm. before. That's right. So, um, yes, they are under threat now, which is really sad. Um, you can mess so with a lot of things, but don't mess with our drop bears, all right? Don't, no. don't touch them. We love those bitey things. We do. Bitey furry animals. Yes. (laughs) So um, the thylacine was a carnivorous marsupial, which was widespread throughout Australia. And if you can imagine like maybe a little, almost like a dog sort of, almost, Mm -hmm. uh, very small with, you know, kind of a tan color, stripes down its back. That's why it's called a um, tiger, Tasmanian tiger. Um, And yeah, the marsupial, amazing animals, marsupials, you know, they have little pouches and, you know, like kangaroos and Mm. they feed their babies with milk in their pouch. Um, That is so cool. Yes. Yes. Monotremes are even more amazing because they lay eggs and they're mammals. But anyway, um, that's Australia. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So um, by the time Europeans arrived in Australia in the 18th century, think Captain Cook, 1788 and all, you know, colonization happening, um, the Tassie tiger was already confined to Tasmania. So by then it it wasn't really on the mainland. Um, Unfortunately, the newcomers, the colonists, um, shot the tiger into extinction through hunting. Um, The last animal died in captivity in 1936. However, all is perhaps not lost because some thylacine babies were taken from the mother's pouches back in the day when, you know, you just, I guess it still happens, you know, take a sample of an animal. But um, they were taken back in the day and preserved in alcohol and kept in the Melbourne Museum. And in 2017, um, scientists from Melbourne University were able to use these specimens um, and actually sequence most of the genome of the thylacine babies. Um, And this was quite a huge breakthrough, which will give scientists now the blueprint on how to make a thylacine. Wow. Um, So there are three ways the project could potentially help to preserve the um, mammal and marsupial species. And, you know, we've heard of some of these. They're like cloning in which you actually need the cells of the animals so or a full set of chromosomes. So I've seen Star replicate. Wars and how it works. Yep. Yeah, yeah, of course oh. you do. <laughs> um, back breeding, which is a kind of selective breeding to produce characters of an animal. Characteristics, sorry. But... Um, Obviously, these two methods are no good for the thylacine as we don't have any actual thylacines um, alive. So since there is mostly intact uh, genetic sequence for the thylacine available, the tiger team hoped to use genetic engineering to make some thylacine babies. Now, is it that easy? So I'm going to read from the ABC News article, which explains um, pretty uh, well, well, according um, to Jurassic Park, it's very easy. Well, obviously they're very advanced and have done it already. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. 
But anyway, so here's some reality for you. <laughs> so <laughs> now go. that we've sequenced the genome, what next? So does that mean we are ready for de-extinction? Not so fast. Mm. When animals die, their DNA becomes fragmented or broken up into shorter strands. The more deteriorated an animal's DNA, the more likely it is to be in many pieces. Genomics researcher Tom Gilbert from the University of Copenhagen explains it is similar to a book that's been put through a shredder. Your goal is to put the book back together, but you don't have any reference for what it's supposed to look like when mm. you're done. You know the order of the words. In the, in the fragments, but not the order of the fragments in the book. So then um, researchers think they can use the complete genome of a closely related living species as a kind of template to figure out how the, PC, the pieces of the extinct genome fit together. And luckily we do still have quite a few um, marsupials um, that are closely related to the thylacine. Mm -hmm. So... In this case, the living species would be the numbat. So the numbat is oh, a little... Oh, the numbat, yes. Wow. A cute little thing, runs yeah, around. Yeah, <laughs> Possum size, cool. I guess, about that size. Um, also got some little stripes on its back. Carnivorous little thing. Um, don't pick one up. Has to um, be carnivorous, doesn't it? Welcome to Australia, everyone. Yes, <laughs> carnivorous marsupials. Um, I'm cute, but I have teeth. <laughs> yes, don't ever pick these things up. They're gorgeous, but they'll give you a good bite. Yep. Anyway, <laughs> it's estimated that 95% of the numbat's DNA is the same as the thylacine. Ah. And earlier this year, a group, of, a group called DNA Zoo Australia, based at the University of Western Australia, completed a chromosome-length 3D genome map of the numbat's genome. Wow. We have been trying to build the base which will enable the genetic rescue of existing species. So it also makes, possible, makes it possible to bring back the extinct thylacine. The idea is that they can first line up the, the matching 95% of the two species DNA and then work out where the remaining 5% of the thylacine DNA fits into the puzzle. So if this can be done by finding short lengths of matching base pair sequences, which might indicate a starting point where a longer fragment that has varied enough through evolution can slot in. If they can map the complete thylacine genome, a process called CRISPR, which kind of builds up the DNA, um, can be used to alter the DNA in a numbat cell to code for the thylacine. And apparently this is all already being used to start making a new woolly mammoth, you know, bringing oh, wow. back the woolly oh, mammoth. Wow. Yes. So, um, oh, wow. I didn't know about that. That's, oh my yes, God, my goodness. Yes. Um, I actually watched a documentary on this a while ago. It's pretty interesting because they have found intact woolly mammoth. They have. Preserved. That's right. yes. yes. which Preserved is, in ice. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. So, what about um, a saber-toothed tiger? I wonder if we could... Oh, if you had something preserved, you could potentially... I'm just about all my childhood animals, sorry. Yes, yeah. <laughs> what um, about a sloth? No, wait, it's Ice Age. Hang on, sorry. We'll get to this. <laughs> anyway. <Yeah. laughs> so um, through the process, they've actually been able to um, um, identify genes that they believe define most significant woolly, woolly mammoth traits like long hair and a raised full forehead and they've already started the process um, and they're hoping that by um, 2027 they'll have like a woolly, woolly mammoth um, elephant hybrid so no way that would be oh amazing goodness. Yeah. Goodness me. Oh, so wow. back to the thylacine hopefully um, you know using once they've you know able to made, make up the full code you know and then using um, you know uh, biotechnology processes and, and technologies um, Eventually, hopefully, they'll be able to make some kind of, you know, an embryo and um, implant it into a surrogate mother. And they're thinking, you know, they're still studying what kind of surrogate mother species they could use. And they're thinking maybe the Dunart or Tassie Devil. Uh, Dunart is like this little rat or mouse, you know, type animal. It's also very bitey. Type, um, yeah, it has teeth, <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully with some more research and improvement in, in the technology, scientists will be able to bring back the thylacine, which would be amazing. Mm. And they, they actually expect that this kind of process that they've started will be really commonplace in about a decade's time. So um, 
you know, so this is really the beginning of the technology. They've come a really long way, as you you know, we've read with the woolly mammoth. And um, yeah, so we could see a, a Tassie tiger come back in, in, you know, who knows in the next, you know, couple of decades maybe and mm. would be really cool. Um, imagine all the species that we've lost that p- potentially, you know, uh, we could bring back. So I just thought I'd put it out there too, guys. What animals... You know, I think we kind of started that. Would you like, you know, would, what's your favourite thing that you'd like to bring back? Like what animal would you love to bring back? Only out of sheer curiosity, the yeah. dodo. Oh, yes, that's <laughs> a good one. Hunted that's to a good extinction one. in Mauritius, yeah. So yeah. out of sheer curiosity, I would just like to see a living dodo and see that's what, you know, one. something I could probably relate to as well. But, you know, yeah. but definitely. There's a moa you know, yeah. bird from New Zealand, which is quite similar, that's been hunted out to out of extinction. It was very large, kind of, bit more like a uh, cassowary type bird. A cassowary. Oh, cassowary. Like yeah, okay. So when you said that, I was being danger. Big and meaty, yes. <laughs> Whoa. But I, I love the woolly mammoth idea and obviously dinosaurs, like, but I don't know if that's a, that's a realistic thing. The, the wow. cassowary Lino, is you? just yeah. a velociraptor yeah. in disguise, let's be honest. Uh, yeah. It's the only true. thing it doesn't have is teeth. <laughs> right, that's that's right. I mean, yeah. I have two dinosaurs in my backyard, my little chickens. <laughs> little the, chickens yeah. Look, if you own chickens, there are some noises they make, which you just think, there's this particular squawk they do, which yeah. is look, that's a dinosaur sound. That's I'm dinosaur. sorry, it's I'll not roaring, but it's it's a dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. definitely have to listen to that because our next door neighbors has have four chickens. Listen it's out cute. for them. It's yeah. cute. I will. I will. It's cute. It's cute. Yeah. Um, yeah. For myself, Caroline, I, I think I'll, I'm the same. But um, vein is um, Tasmanian tiger. Yeah. Yeah. I was always always seeing pictures of it and think, and I, I think one time I asked Dad, "Hey, Dad, is there a Tasmanian tiger in, in Tassie?" He goes, "Son." Yeah, it's so sad, isn't it? Yeah, that's actually for me. Just a Tasmanian tiger. Yeah, dinosaurs like everyone else. You know what? Dinosaurs would be cool. It's the ultimate, really. Yeah, it is the ultimate. But I think we've seen too much Jurassic Park and just the the, what's it called? The um, theory of it's going to go. It's going to go iffy. So it might not be a good idea, but it would be yeah. super cool. It was super, it but you know what? Cool. There's 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 six movies, right? Mm. And in each movie, you know how it's going to go. I, exactly. Man meets I dinosaur. Think... Yeah. Man loses to dinosaur. Man has to run away. Man you know gets eaten every by movie. dinosaur. <sighs> and and in fact, the next the the next movie that's coming out, the sixth one, is just basically dinosaurs dominating the world. It's even called Jurassic World Dominion. I like <laughs> so, that. Well, it's all all of them, both the movies that are the new the new set and the older set because yep. um Sam Neill's back, of course um Sir Richard Attenborough can't be there because the people. yes oh no not Richard is no, it Richard da- uh, David David no 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 David's still alive no. sorry Richard Sir Richard Attenborough Richard. yeah yeah yeah, yeah he but um back. it's the older and new coming together yeah. which seems to be the same thing for every movie but anyway mm. that's part of the entertainment <laughs> section yes <laughs> yeah but, but you, knew, you knew when you started this that this was going to turn into I a Jurassic know. Park but look, chat, he, sorry sorry he's another line, sorry. bit more extrapolated thinking um you know in terms of what you would do in in science class so. We picked what animal, what would we like? But now just say, for example, you did make a new dinosaur. Would it have the instincts that a dinosaur back in the day had to eat? Like, would would it be enough of a dinosaur, like, to know that it's carnivorous and it's it wants to hunt and all of that? Isn't that interesting? Like, how, even a thylacine, like, how does it? How would it know it's a thylacine? <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah, this was, and again, sorry to bring up Jurassic Park, but on a serious point, the Jurassic World movies were kind of hinting at this. It's like, we've made these creatures, but are they really dinosaurs? They're not, they're not the dinosaurs that, that lived, you know, millions of years That's ago. Right. Uh, or be, Yeah. That, so are they really dinosaurs was the question that, you know, that the, the movie was kind of in one of its themes getting at. And it's the same deal, like you were just saying, like if we made a thylacine, as cool as it is, would it be a thylacine? Or would it just be something that's been, for be- lack of a better word, programs, you know, genetically by, through genetic altered, engineering. Genetically yeah. manipulated, yeah. yeah. Engineered, yeah. Interesting, isn't it, though? Mm. It is. Yeah. It, it, can you do that, Caroline? Can you, was it, what's the DNA? It's been, I mean, they're trying. In, yeah. They've got 95% of the sequence, which is quite a lot. But, you know, 5% can still, is still a lot, like, to fill in. And, you know, they, they have to get, I mean, I, doubt they'll I mean I can't say I doubt but how do you know they're going to get that last five percent perfect like 
is it going to be as it actually was in the th- the last five percent? Maybe if they could get DNA from a few different ones and fill in the gaps that way, um, you know. I mean, it mentions ninety five percent. I think they just got it from one, but I'm not sure if they got it from more. So I guess there's more work there, but you know, hopeful, hopeful, and um quite interesting so i'd be keen to see even if it's mostly a thylacine i think that would be amazing um, oh, definitely you know and imagine the, the reintroducing them to the environment again i mean you'd still have a, a mostly thylacine back in nature which would be cool yeah in in terms of um so i can see advantages in things like uh, yeah. you know for, um especially for animals that might have been hunted by humans yes. out of you know um out of existence and the effects that has on biodiversity, yeah, obviously, those, you know, yeah. which is so important as well. Yeah. You know, when we take something out or add something in, if we're not yeah. careful about it, it can actually upset everything. So, it does. And that's not the scientific way of putting it, but you know what I no, mean. No, you're right, though. So, it's balance, yeah, and, balance. And every species has a specific role in the ecosystem to play. Mm. So, yeah. um, so like Tasmania is quite... Uh, not remote, but it's it's a lot of it's untouched. And if you yes. could kind of reintroduce it into mm. where it sat before, I don't know what kind of a balance has gone out because of the yeah. thylacine leaving. But perhaps you know if you reintroduce it, some kind of balance would be restored. Yeah, um, and there's even the yeah. the ethics of of reintroducing something back into the environment mm-hmm. and the effects it could have on human lives as well. True. Because, you know, so as we know that the, the food chain or, you know, biodiversity mm. affects, you know, it can affect the local environment, even the global environment possibly, and how that, and how that could yeah. affect the day-to-day living of human beings. And I'm not being, not like the extreme, yeah. like animals coming after us, but what I mean is just the, is just, you know, could it affect, for example, a food source or, the way mm. that the way that we farm, for example, you know, like for yeah. example, introducing you know dogs into particular settings, um, created this situation where now in Australia, for example, we have wild dogs that affect farms and, and affect farm animals and you know hunts farm, you know. So th- this uh, the introduction or reintroduction, I guess they would have to balance the idea of how would this ultimately affect human lives because as cool as it would be to see a thylacine or a woolly mammoth or even a dinosaur, uh, that there's also the effect on the local community and the global community, I guess, that would need to be thought about well, too. Number one, introducing, reintroducing a cute thing back into the environment, tick for me. Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> that's a tick for me too, yeah. Um, but I mean, like in the case of, say, a thylacine where it was in the habitat before, I mean, just say now, you know, we've got more introduced species like cats and, and rats and things like that that we don't particularly want in the natural habitat because they do disrupt the natural ecosystem quite a bit. Perhaps a carnivorous animal like the thylacine would be helpful and just mm. go eat them up and, Snack you know, time. kind of, yeah, and yeah. then maybe other species who are in decline yeah. may reemerge, you know, and, and their populations grow larger. So there are uh, possible, um, you know, advantages as well. It's really fun to think yes, about though, isn't it? Is, it is, yeah. And in fact, you know what? I'd like to hear what our people who are yes. listening would have to say on Discord. Yes, <laughs> sqpn.com talk to us slash Discord. Discord. Sign I, up today. I would love to hear more of this um, discussion. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for that, Caroline. That was a, I really enjoyed that topic. Good. So, I'm glad. Uh, yeah, let's move on now and uh, let's have a discussion about entertainment. I don't know where you get your delusions, laser brain. This is not what we came here to do. No, but it's what I'm going to do. I have a plan. You've got a plan. I have part of a plan. Are you not entertained? All right. So, uh, do you mind if I start today? Because I've been I've been holding on to this for almost two yeah. weeks now. I've been so oh excited God. to talk about it. Yeah, uh, literally, 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 this is not a rant. Is it? it's, it's not it's a rant. Okay. No, no, no. no. Okay. This is like it's, you and I have had rants yeah. throughout these our episodes. Yeah. And it's not Caroline's turn. Oh, Caroline, you get, you don't have a rant yet, no? No. Um, I'm pretty happy right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's, she's I'd right. like she's to stay that way. <laughs> no, no, no. She's okay. Yeah. All right. Um, mine is a, a rant of excitement in a way. Uh, okay. I've always loved, I've always loved Batman, uh, you know, from a child. I've always, you know, so I, used to, I grew up watching uh, Adam West with the, you know, with the dance moves and the whatever else. Right? So I've always loved. Oh, the Batusi. Yeah. If yeah, you could see right. me doing it. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, all of that. Um, Don't and, publish you know, that, please. The Bat yeah. Shark Repellent and whatever, you know. I love Bat Shark Repellent. Yeah. 
If only yeah. mosquito repellent would work that yeah, well. I wish. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> but all, you know, all of that. But I've always enjoyed Batman in in the different variations and whatever. So I, I you know, I thought um, that uh, the second is it Batman Returns, the second one with Michael Keaton. I thought that film, you know, was a classic. I thought it was, you know, that, you know, some of it's, it's cringy and whatever else, you know, but. Oh, they um, all but cringe are, a bit, aren't they? There are, yeah, <laughs> but there are, like, there are so many good character moments in that yes. that, that are done well. You know, I loved, um, you know, Chris Nolan's version of Batman with his trilogy. You know, The Dark Knight was obviously a standout. Um, but now I, I watched the latest uh, iteration, which was, um, I think it's Matt Reeves um, was the director and starring Robert Pattinson as The Batman. And uh, without spoiling it, this film takes place in Batman's second year as Batman, so he's still rough around the edges. Uh, still got a lot of stuff to deal with in terms of you know in terms of um, you know being this very dark and brooding kind of character. Um, and it's also um, there are you know the, the main villain is a Riddler. That's not a spoiler. And there are a couple of other who plays the Riddler. Oh, oh sorry, I don't know his name, but. He was brilliant. Because you've got to be good to play good. the Riddler. Uh, he, yeah, he he took was... on the role of a fanaticized yes, person um, yeah. so well, uh, like just so so well. Like yeah, awesome. his he his character was meant to be disturbing, and he got that. He it, really? It was, yeah, it was. You know, uh, Heath Ledger's Joker. If Heath Ledger captured the Joker, this guy and I forgot his name. I feel so bad about this, That's but okay. this guy yeah. captured the Riddler so well. Awesome. Um, and, and it was. Uh, again, I can't spoil what happens, right? But the thing is, uh, this one, y- you know how Batman come, becomes a bit nicer, you know, uh, by the end of a film, usually it c- kind of heads in that direction. In this one, the change is only slight, uh, which is really good. It's not like, oh, this is suddenly a new, a new person by the end of it. You know, he's, Bruce Wayne is still kind of the same, you know, by the end of the film. However, there's just, just a little bit more hope. By the end, just this is twinge. You know what I mean? It's just sort of, it's just starting to appear. And I love how they did that. It was so good. Um, and uh, music and sound and tension, it, they, they really went back to the detective kind of Batman. And uh, I was saying to my son, because I watched it with Damien, my older son, we went to the drive in to watch it. Um, felt like there wasn't a lot of action. It's like this really long three hour movie and Batman. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot of Batman, but I, I thought not a lot of action myself, which were, I thought was actually really good. And he said to me, dad, there was so much action. So I don't know, yeah. but I don't, maybe I was just focused on the character so much. Maybe. Uh, yeah. But the, I just, I just love that they've captured this Batman who's the detective and he's got this great relationship with, um, with, com- he's not commissioner Gordon. He's just Lieutenant Gordon right now. Oh, that's uh, right, Lieutenant. Yeah. yeah he was still um, Lieutenant there, wasn't he? And he yeah. doesn't do the Batman disappearing thing. You know how, like, you're talking to Batman and then he disappears? And he's like, yes. uh, yeah. They, they, they <laughs> don't, don't do any of that. Maybe he'll do that in the next film. But they, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, they, they just, I don't know. They, for me, it was like watching, I, I said this to a few people, it was, like a, it was like a Netflix series, right, that had just been cobbled together into, into, a, into a movie, like six episodes you know, that had been filmed and then made into a movie. And I say that in a positive way in that there's, there's a story and it's long and it develops and, you know, there might be some flaws in the movie that nothing's ever perfect. But in terms of Batman, this was, this was right up there as one of my favorite Batman films. And and I actually can't wait to watch it again. Um, They do this thing with sounds like, you know, when Batman's approaching, his footsteps are really heavy Uh... and you sort of, in the perspective of the, of the baddies and, and how afraid they are. Like yeah. they're all like, you know, oh, I'm tough guy, whatever, beating this, you know, beating this vulnerable person up or picking on someone. And then you hear the footsteps and then the music starts, the Batman, you know, theme starts and it's like, he's coming and they're all turning around, you know, trying to hear where, you know, cause all you can hear is the sound. You can't see him yet. Yeah. And then he emerges and he's not like flying out and kicking someone. He just, <laughs> kind of, he just know. walks onto the scene, you know? And, um, yeah, it's just done so well, uh, and I was really impressed. And um, Zoe Kravitz as, as Catwoman, uh, as Selena Kyle was it was also really good. As Zoe a, Kravitz, Linz, that yeah. was so good. Yeah, of course um, she's a daughter of um, Lenny. Lenny Kravitz, yeah. Are you oh, gonna yeah. go my way? Yeah, but, um, but, <laughs> I love but that as, song. Yeah, FYI. but as the um, I love it too, yeah. <laughs> but but as the as the character that he interacts with, it's done really well. I, um, they don't they don't overdo anything from my point of view. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's just a, a, like a fun film to watch as a Batman fan. Uh, I think for some people, it's going to be very long. Like Damien and I, again, it was the drive-in at two hours. I looked at Damien and said, 
this scene's really quiet and I need to go to the toilet. And he's like, cool, so do I. So we ran off to the bathroom quickly and came back again. And we didn't miss too much. It was, you know, it was just a quiet talky scene. So it was okay, thankfully. Yeah. But, um, but as far as Batman films go, like I said, this is, this is one of my favorites. I really enjoyed what they did with it. And I, and I really hope that we get more. And, and I hope that they, they maintain the goodness without making it too pop culture or without saying it needs more action or it needs more this or it needs more that. But, but use that formula that they've created as the foundation and, and, and build on it. Anyway, that's my loving rant of, of the Batman. And uh, I'd love to know what anyone else who's seen it thinks about it as well. Uh, Caroline, <laughs> is it cake? <laughs> <laughs> This is my new favorite show. <laughs> I always watch high class things. Um, so <laughs> They're enjoyable and they make you laugh. Wow. Yes, yeah. it's, it's um, you know light entertainment. Okay, so there's this new show on Netflix called "Is It Cake?" and um, basically, um, okay, so it's a baking show, kind of a little bit different, where there's a group of bakers and the Show host brings out a podium full of items, say shoes, handbags, can be anything, and one of them will be a cake. Okay. But the 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 bakers will have to choose. So there's a competition between them to choose which one is the cake. All right. And whoever chooses the one that is cake gets to go on to the next round. All right. And so they do this process and the, the host will come out with a big knife and the one they choose, he'll try cut it. And if it doesn't cut like cake, obviously it's not cake. And the one that's, you know, one of them will be cake. And they're pretty amazing, you know, like these amazing cakes meant like to look like a handbag or to look like a, could be anything. Anyway, so then the next round, the bakers then have to make something you know, an item that looks like cake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and for that round, then they will get a panel of three judges, can be a comedians or some, some well-known somebody. And those three, so have to pick um, their eye. So say if there, there'll be three bakers in the round. So say if one of the bakers makes a shoe, um, there'll be a podium full of, say, like five different shoes and one of them will be the one that the baker made. <laughs> it's a cake. And wow. then the, the judges will have to guess, you know, which one of them is the cake. And if they can't guess, then, um, you know, the the baker, you know, like wins and gets to go to the, the next, next round. And um, so they do this for the three. And if they get a three-way tie like they did in the episode last night, the judges get to taste all the cake and decide which is the one best one based ah, on that. Oh, wow. Well. Cool. Then okay. the remaining baker has to – so then the show makes – they've got this big bag of money, two of them. One will be a cake and one won't be. They'll be identical. And then the that baker has to choose which one is the cake. And if – they choose the cake one, they get a further bonus of money. So, yeah, it's a really fun <laughs> – it's really fun. <laughs> it's really fun to see. I mean, there are so many talented bakers out there who can make items that are cake, but you just can't tell they're cake. It's just the talent is amazing. Creativity and I love knows cake. no bounds. That's yeah. right. I love cake. So you can give me a cake <laughs> in the shape of anything, you know, and – you know, I love baking shows anyway. I wish there were more of the American ones here on Australian TV wow. and Netflix because I just love them. And me and the no, boys. Too many. <laughs> no, too no, many. there aren't enough. <laughs> like there's one, oh, like um, there's the Spring Baking Championship. There's the Kids Baking cha There's so like there's all this kind of things that it's really hard to get a hold of here. But um, and probably you guys in America, are, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, they're <laughs> probably me, like they're probably sick of it. We got too many. I know, and we Have probably a, we gave the Master Chef and Master Chef. I think I've mentioned before, Master Chef America is way, way more um, sensational than it is over here. He over here is a little yeah. bit yeah. stuffy, and yeah, so yeah, it's not, yeah. Um, oh yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but um, yeah. So is it cake? Go and try it at home. Make something that's um, you know, a cake. But try and fool us. I'll, I'll and just I want make, to try some. I'll just make it an actual cake. <laughs> you can yes. Just, Is it cake? Because the way I cook, yes. the way I cook, when you taste it, you'll have to determine if it's actually <laughs> cake or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's going to happen now? No we'll, comment. You're going to go to Lindsay's place or your, your place, Caroline. Yeah. I'll go, Caroline. Is this cake? Is this cake? 
Here's a beer slice. It. Oh, it is cake. Mm. It is cake. Mm. Oh, that's oh, actually cake. Oh, no, it could be an insult, Oops, isn't it? It's like, oh, is that cake? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's how you deliver the line. That's true. Is it, it. Is it cake? Is, is, or is that a cake? Is yeah. That a, are, you, are you sure this is cake? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Because like, it I guess actually tastes like a shoe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are some cakes that I've had that unfortunately do taste that way, but it's rare. It's but rare. not the Archbishop's lemon tart. That was amazing. That was delicious. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Yep. Just Anytime, y- mm. yep. Archbishop, you'd like us, you know, to invite us over for a lemon tart and a yep. cup of tea. We're yep. up for the it. Catholic Leadership Centre. We'll we'll take it. Yeah, yes. we're in. Definitely, Thank definitely. you. Yep. Yum yum yum. Yes. Lido, yeah. anything uh, that you've been yeah. entertained by recently? Well, the same, once again, with you, Lindsay, we saw the Batman last weekend. Oh, you saw it. Excellent. Yeah. Saw it. Sorry. Well, we, yeah. We haven't seen, oh, yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. oh, you, had, you, you did come to Mass on Sunday, so I was, I was hoping to get yeah. it. No, no. It's all good. It's all, what did you I think? Understand. It was good. Yeah. It was very good. Yeah, Caroline, if you have a chance to see it, see it's it. very good. I, How'd you manage I, with the three hours? Uh, it was okay, actually. It wasn't too <laughs> bad. Um, This is the main thing, guys. I... I also, we were talking to Bernie. We we thought of finding it looking like um the Gotham series, yeah, yeah, the TV yeah. series they had. Oh, that yeah, that was pretty gritty. Yeah, yeah. sometimes psychological. Um, yeah. we found it like like that. Mm. And um, yeah, what was his name? Um, Patterson. Robert Patterson was good. Mm. I liked him as a younger version of Batman. Same. Uh, yeah, everything. The production, the lighting, like Lindsay was saying when mm. you, when you first hear it, yeah, hear that you know, his footsteps. The footsteps. Goes, that was like, oh, what's going yeah. on? Here? And he just, he just really darkly emerges from the du- of course, yeah. from the darkness. Yeah. And what I liked about it is they portray Gotham as sadly what Gotham is. Yes, it's very it's, Gotham-like. Yeah, it's, it's very dark. Yeah, it's gritty. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. crime infested. Yeah, crime yeah. infested. Corrupt cops. Except, yeah. And in, and once again, yeah, I don't know if you notice in it, or any um Batman films that you don't see the sun that much. Mm. It's not bright, and you just see. Yeah. Well, flowers. The only time you see flowers in a funeral over there, mm. sadly. But um, yeah, it's so. I don't know. So, <laughs> I'm trying to find find the word when depressing. <laughs> the city <laughs> itself, it is. It's, you're you're right though, and that's that's sadly, deliberate. Yeah, it is. It was so yeah. it's so depressing. And on top of that, I mean, there's mm. the fear of because Caroline, it's it's like a psychological thrill in a lot mm. of it. Like, it is. You know, like I, people are actually dying. You know, there's yeah, there's right. like a, a murder spree. Mm. The Riddler is is like killing individuals, yeah. but high ranking ones. Yeah. So. It brings fear into the, you know, into the community as well. Yeah. So that there's, um, it captures that really well. Well, anytime yeah. either of you would like to mind my boys, so I can go have a movie <laughs> night or day. Done. Okay. You're quite welcome. We, yeah. We, we, tag team. Tag team. Yeah. Tag, tag, yeah. Tag, I'll take um, an hour and a half later. Then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no. I'll, I'll play. I'll, is I'll, it cake? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Good so game. The, the, yeah. The, 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 the Batman was good. Um. Yeah. That was the only that was the only one movie yep. we saw. But we last night we decided watching um Blacklist again. Oh, oh yep. my goodness me! It, I don't know where they're getting these stories from. It just <laughs> they just can really keep on going with the series, and it gets really really good. Okay, um, cool. Dave, what's his name? David Spader. Yes, from from Stargate. Stargate. Daniel Jackson. Movie, yeah. Movie. He is so good in that. So yeah. we'll be watching that. Um, I've been a bit slack on um F one. <laughs> but I heard there's um F one coming here to Melbourne, so I think I'll watch that too. So nice, yeah, mm-hmm. nothing, awesome. Nothing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we uh, cap it off, uh, the um the penguin car chase scene with the Batmobile, uh, just amazing. I just I'm uh, keen to see I, the bat the, the, the penguin. way it concludes. I cannot believe that was Colin Farrell. I couldn't believe it either, and he yeah. was so Colin good. Colin the penguin is one of the best bad guys. Yeah, he I, was really good. Nice. Caroline, I need to oh my see, goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the, who yeah. was it who played? Is it Danny DeVito who did it? Yes, yeah, that's he right. Was, yeah. He did it really well. The really exaggerated nice. penguin. Very, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yes. Oh. And yeah. uh, what's her name? Who did Catwoman? Oh my goodness. Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer. I liked. I liked that. Yeah. You know, movie yeah. that was really good. Cool. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty keen to see this one. I just, yeah, yeah. like I said, anytime. Yes. Yeah. Find the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and Look, it's as been a, out for a while, yeah, guys. It's been out yeah. since the start of. I'm March, missing so. so many movies, but I'm I'm yeah. pretty sure we're going to go see some kids' movies during the holidays <gasps> yeah, coming brilliant. up. So that would oh, be good. Talk about kids' movies. There was a movie I saw. Uh, 
uh, was it a preview for? And when we were watching Batman, I can't remember. It's just gone off my mind now. It looked pretty good to see. There's I one called, I think it's called Bad Guys. That, that, yes. Is that the one? Yes. Yeah, uh, that yeah. one looks Apparently, really good. There was something on the news about it. It's an Australian author. Oh, right. Who, okay. Who did the, um, awesome. The, the, the thing. So it looks pretty cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's good. it. That's it. Yeah. Bad Guys, yeah. Something yeah. else to look forward to. Great. Yeah. 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 All right. So, um, yeah, thanks for all that, guys. And uh, we want to thank everyone else for listening to, uh, joining us, I should say, for episode 75 of the Catholics of Oz. Oh, before we go, we've got some listener feedback. So I got an email from oh. Sarah, who I think we can say we can elevate to friend of the show as well. Yeah, she yeah. is a friend of the show. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Friend of the show. Um, I love this. So you know how we got a bit sidetracked with uh, with Shakespeare last at the start of oh, last no. episode. Oh, so, yes. oh, no. So feedback from Sarah. Number one. Romeo and Juliet is not all right, in bold, not a love story. I'm pretty sure we said that too. Yeah, definitely yeah. a love story. Yeah. It's a story of teenage uh, of teenage lust. There is no way two teenagers met, fell in love, and then died over three days. I'll buy the resurrection happening after three days, but not a love story. So that's great feedback. Okay, I love and, that. Uh, all right, embrace yourself, guys. By the way, uh, Juliet was 13 and... Mel Gibson as Hamlet was terrible. Worst movie version. <laughs> no comment okay. on that one. I no. had a great giggle with that. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that, Sarah. That was that was wonderful. Oh, I love, love it. Feedback. Thank you, Sarah. Hamlet Hamlet again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna watch Hamlet again. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> or not. But anyway. Or a different yeah. version, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Freedom. So, yeah. Oh, that's a long. No, that's the other one. That's, Braveheart. Braveheart. that's the other one. Braveheart. Okay. So sorry, before we go, we'd like to take a moment to thank all of the patrons who make it possible for us to create the Catholics of Oz on the. Quest Network. Today, we would like to thank Rick H., Adam C., Anne G., Alison K., and Thaddeus P. Through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for the Catholics of Oz and all of the other shows at StarQuest to continue. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Also, we've talked about a lot of things. The Patrick Oration, such an important speech that we heard mm-hmm. this year from Archbishop Comensoli, bringing back animals that are extinct, the Batman. And, and is it cake? <laughs> so, so many things. Is it cake? Uh, yeah, we'd love to know <laughs> your thoughts. So um, you can do that by going to uh, sqpn.com slash oz and sharing your thoughts there. Or just go straight to Discord and go and interact directly with us. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, and also don't forget that SQPN has a newsletter where it puts out all of its uh, you know updates and all of its shows, sqpn.com slash about slash newsletter. And don't forget that we have our own Facebook page, facebook.com slash splash slash Catholics, <laughs> slash Catholics of Oz, spelt O-Z, <laughs> um, where we post some regular updates as well, including I put an update about uh, happy birthday, Archbishop Peter Comensoli. Uh, well, it will be for the other week now, but a very yeah. happy birthday to you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. on the Feast of the Annunciation. So, um, yeah. Nice and time. also, yeah. speaking of the Annunciation, we will talk about Pope Francis's dedicating of yes. um, Ukraine and I actually Russia. heard it during the night. Um, I woke up and managed to get, you know, oh, just you did. on time. I did. Yeah, because it was, was 3 a.m. overnight for us it was at the time of recording. Yes, yeah. But I did manage to listen to it half asleep. It was awesome. beautiful. Yeah, so yeah. we'll definitely have some things to um to reflect on for um in our next episode yes, on that as well. 100%. Yeah. But tell us your reflections before we record. We'd be happy to share those too in our next episode. Uh, so we can also be reached by email at catholicsofoz at sqpn.com. Caroline, I know you have to run. Thank you so much for being on episode 75 today. Thank you. It was awesome. And just look out for things because they might be cake. <laughs> they could be. You don't know. <laughs> and Lino, thank you so much as well for joining us for today's episode. This is definitely not cake to my phone. <laughs> but, um, yeah, look, <laughs> look um, well, well, just one thing about the Batman before we leave. I love that Pete, I mean, the actor didn't have to do a Batman thing. Oh, you're Batman. Yes, or, you're right. Thank yeah, goodness yes. he just used his own yeah. normal voice. And uh, also Michael Keaton didn't, didn't do that, did he? No? No, no he didn't. Oh, no. So no. goodness me, they've, they've gone back to normal Batman. That's Will Arnett, yeah. yes, he did though. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Lego Movie. Awesome. Best Batman, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. He's great. He's a great Batman. <laughs> He's a Batman. He, yeah. is. he is. He's a great Batman. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much again. I'm Lindsay Sant. Thank you for listening to episode 75 of The Catholics of Oz on StarQuest. <laughs>